Okay, I'm the moderator for the first panel. So this whole event is about raising um, money in Silicon Valley. Uh, so we're going to go over the funding requirement. Uh, so I uh, just want to have a quick check. How many of you are startup founder? Can you raise your hand and hold your hand? Founders. Okay. How many of you are technical? Hold your hand. Technical. Okay. Now, how many of you are investor? Raise your hand. Hold your hand. Uh, how many of you actually are VC? Raise your hand. VC. Okay, so we have more VC on the stage. <laughs> um, uh, so um, we already introduced all the speakers, so I don't have to go through, you know, uh, the detail uh, bio. But um, I would like to introduce them, uh, the firm and the fund, by asking, you know, some questions. So. Uh, how many funds do you manage and what is your fund size? Can we start with Alan? Sure, I'm the wrong guy to start with. So we are a family office. So um, we have been managing about five billion. Um, and so the key distinguishing characteristics are that it's just one pool of capital that's always invested. And that means we don't have to urge a a uh, startup or a portfolio company to exit uh, within a five-year time frame to raise a track record so that we can show it to raise another fund. So we're um, fortunate in the fact that we don't have to fundraise and we don't have to kick companies out of their portfolios when I feel. Okay, so we're going to go through this very quickly because I have tons of questions and very limited time. Just barely one hour. So Matt. Okay. Uh, so Turnipick is a... Um, C stage focus, basically anything before Series A, from angel to C to pre C, anything before Series A. Uh, mostly invest into people one, two, three, below five, basically. And Chirpik has uh, three funds, but I don't want to mention my fund size <laughs> right next to uh, Family House, but um, it's C stage focus. So um, usually ticket size is between anything below half million because it's a good number to start your own business at the uh, mobile era. Yes, yeah. all US dollars, okay. Uh, Richard. So Iron Fire Capital, we have two funds. We have one fund is a, a hedge fund that invests in public equities. And then a fund that I think people are more interested in is our angel fund, which is new, it's about a year old. And uh, we're about like uh, 20 million. And we invest in both uh, U.S. and China, um, mostly in the SaaS, uh, hardware, software integration, and um, platforms. Hi, good, good afternoon. I'm actually not from Silicon Valley. I'm from Shanghai. And I noticed that uh, some of you uh, uh, start a bit not in the technology space, and then you can look for me. So we invest not only in technology, but also in uh, traditional industry, especially service, uh, education, and uh, uh, healthcare-related space. And uh, I'm from Delta Capital, and Delta Capital uh, managing two RMB fund and one US dollar fund, and uh, in total amount of uh, uh, equivalent to 300 million US dollars. And we invest in companies uh, in mainland China, uh, primarily in late stage uh, VC stage, uh, or the early stage uh, private equity stage. So basically it's the serious A and B uh, rounds. And we mainly are looking for company who we define uh, already past the, the technology risk or the business model risk. And you have uh, uh, some reasonable you know, revenue figures and doesn't have to be profitable. And, uh, uh, and you have a very, very you know, uh, big potential to growth in mainland China. And uh, if you uh, fit these patterns, um, please, uh, you can get in touch with me. Thank you. Uh, so since Archimedes Labs allowed me to go out here, um, they actually love me doing PR for them. So I'm going to talk about Archimedes a little bit. So Archimedes, Archimedes Labs is a Palo Alto-based startup incubator. We have a uh, you know seed fund. 
so it all started um, by Keith Tear and Mike Allenton in 2005, and TechCrunch was incubated by Archimedes Labs, acquired by AOL in 2010. Uh, Agio is acquired by LookSmart. Uh, Archimedes invests in mobile first startup, and uh, we look at three things um, mobile, consumer, and social. Uh, so we can publicly announce that we have about you know 11 startups, um, and uh, so we can uh, go to the next uh, area. So what is your investment thesis focus area? Starting for me again? Okay, thank you. And um, so we invest into clean energy companies. We invest into agriculture-focused companies. Uh, we have a... Uh, bent to invest into automobile uh, technology related companies as best highlighted uh, e-commerce uh, primarily for the consumer um, and that's been where we've been investing you have a lot to say <laughs> yeah so um, I basically uh, chirp invest in anything that disruptive uh, so you know we have portfolio from uh, media content and anim animation hardware software wearable e-commerce, social commerce, mobile gaming. Uh, we have about close to 40 companies uh, in you know, uh, San Francisco area, uh, China, Taiwan, Korea, and going to have Japan. And of course, I'm very um, honored to uh, participate into uh, two startups here in Hong Kong. And they've been you know, doing very, very well, and I'm really impressed. Um, and then so I basically, because I myself was an entrepreneur, so I really, you know, look into the product where um, can significantly disrupt um, the, the, the industry or ecosystem. That's basically what we're looking for. Well, that's great. I want to co-invest with you. Uh, so Iron Fire Capital, we have about 20 companies in our portfolio right now, and we invest mostly in U.S. company, but also like have uh, several companies in China and Hong Kong. So actually, one of the company from Cyberport, Coachbase, yes. Um, we mostly invest in SaaS uh, and also in like cloud computing platforms. So mobile, cloud, big data, those are big themes. But also, uh, as you know, like wearable computing, hardware, these are also like emerging trends that we also look at. Um, for Delta Capital, uh, we have uh, three funds. Uh, the first the US, uh, RMB fund was uh, fully invested. Already we invest in 17 companies. And uh, the second RMB fund, we invested nine companies, and uh, the third fund was the US dollar fund, and we've made uh, uh, four investments so far. And uh, uh, our investment uh, focusing area, one is uh, uh, for the consumer, and the consumer is a, a very big concept, and uh, we are mainly focusing in the uh, consumer service, which actually including um, companies like a restaurant chain, and it can be uh, like uh, educational related, we invested in one of the biggest uh, uh, kindergarten chain in China. And it can also can be healthcare service related. So we actually put all these things uh, uh, in the consumer bucket, but actually there are lots of subsectors. And the second uh, big sector is a uh, clean tech. And uh, we invested in a company doing water treatment and a solid waste treatment. And uh, uh, companies like um, producing uh, new equipment for uh, like lead acid battery uh, manufacturing, which uh, can create a lot of new uh, lead contamination. But with this new technology, it can minimize the you know the env environmental or like uh, contaminations by producing these batteries. And the third sector we are um, uh, focusing is the TNT part, and uh, we are mainly. Uh, looking at uh, uh, technology heavy companies and uh, in this sector um, we can take you know a bold leap uh, to invest in the real early stage company actually two of the companies we invested uh, only had um, uh, generating revenue with uh, customer you know, trial orders um, but for this kind of uh, investment we are um, we put high emphasis on the technology entry barriers so the two companies we invested all have technology um, from Boston and the Silicon Valley, and they are uh, doing manufacturing uh, in Taiwan, and the many customer main customers are in, in China and Japan and uh, uh, Korea. 
So uh, these are the three type of, you know, broader area we cover. Thank you. Um, so uh, the question is how many startups in your portfolio and how many of them are exit? And can you mention any well-recognized startups? So I think some of them actually mentioned some of them, but I'm going to start with Archimedes Labs. So um, we invest in MDOT uh, in 2012, and uh, it was acquired by GoDaddy uh, early this year. So we have a exit already. And um, our, uh, we co-invest Quixi with Innovation and Duvers, which is, you know, like a, ex, uh, a Google CEO fund. And um, Quixi is now in Series C, close 50 million. Uh, so if you go to uh, Castro Street in uh, Mountain View, uh, you will see Quixie because it stands out in the middle of downtown with three-story high building. Um, okay, so would you like to mention a few things that recognizable in your portfolio? Sure, thank you, Bess. Um, uh, one that is on fire literally recently called uh, Tesla. Um, another one called SpaceX, um, which is uh, shooting rockets into space um uh if you're in the consumer space you might have seen or bought this one called uh, vitamin water you've seen it in the starbucks uh, outside it got bought by coca-cola um let's see yammer for those in the b2b enterprise space that got bought by microsoft um if you're in uh, double bottom line someone mentioned that earlier um this company that came out of Stanford Design School called Embrace, which is targeting to save up to 40 million uh, babies that die of hypothermia every year. And um, I guess you know, those are the ones to start with, and I'll pass it. I'm basically a customer to many of your portfolios. <laughs> yeah, so um, to me, uh, well, there's several things I'd like to mention. Uh, so one thing is a company called uh, Zep. So if you guys go to Apple Store, uh, there's a wearable, sports wearable, uh, target for golf. So you wear your golf glove and you swing, major your uh, swing pad, and then you can compare with your coach or Tiger Woods, see how the angle difference. Uh, the company was funded by a former product manager of MacBook Pro in Cupertino. Um, so this one has been really a big blast. Uh, the company just got featured by Wall Street Journal this uh, last week. So that's one wearable company I'm really excited. And then we just launched a new product that's targeting tennis and baseball, which is my territory. Um, yeah, because I grew up as a tennis player. So uh, I have many friends who are still on the tour. So you probably will see many of the <laughs> uh, top players who endorse the products. Uh, second one I'd like to share with you is a company called Ali. So it's a red little fox. Um, it's a one of the most cartoon, uh, popular cartoon character in China. You probably see it on your uh, WeChat or uh, QQ. Uh, it's a little red fox. So I invest a company when the designer just graduated from Tsinghua, one person. Um, so we had a chat, and then you know I, I kind of you know really love the product, and then have the dream because I uh, grew up in uh, Florida, so right next to Disney, and I always have a dream if I can someday you know <laughs> create another Disney uh, you know for my country, that would be really awesome. And then uh, we have over 10 million active fans now. And uh, we sold over 2 million stuff animal a year, uh, 1.5 million comic book a year. So we are on the way. So that's the second one I'm really excited. And not to mention uh, IPVO. IPVO is also a portfolio. Uh, we are doing really something very good, not only you know, in the business perspective, but also you know, for the education system, where we really have the opportunity to change the way classroom technology does. So that's uh, several things, and then uh, there's uh, many things that you probably also use right now. Um, but you know, for ma many of the deal, um, because like I said, I'm really hands-on, so I really like to um, work with the partner. Uh, I mean, work with the entrepreneur and be their best partner and to the, to grow the business. And the largest uh, company I grew um, was a company I invested in 2006, uh, three people, and today with 900. Uh, we are today the, uh, the largest live video community in China. 250 million users, uh, daily active users over 10 million. Yeah, it's several company I, go, I help. So for us, um, I'll talk about like one company in each of our focus area. For SaaS, 
Uh, for those of you who are really in, in, into fashion, uh, Fashion GPS is the company that we invest in and it's like the leading B2B uh, technology player in uh, the fashion world. They basically manage all the Fashion Week, the New York Fourth Fashion Week, Paris Fashion Week, and also help them manage the uh, sample tracking to um, working with like style.com and all the PR agencies. So really helping to solve a lot of problem in the fashion uh, industry, which has historically been very untechnical, you know. Um, that's uh, Fashion GPS in the SaaS side. Then on the platform side, we invest in a company called Scopely. Uh, for those who are in the gaming, that you probably know this is a company, a platform that helps um, non-US developers to go into US gaming uh, 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 market. Uh, the third one would be uh, hardware and software integration. We invest in a company called Dolly Wireless. They do base station um, uh, power amplifiers, so they help the both indoors and outdoor, especially with like LTE, you know, like uh, requirement in energy, bandwidth, accuracy. So Dolly Wireless is disruptive technology that helps uh, save energy by 50%, uh, increase the throughput, and also increase the accuracy. So these are the companies that we're very excited about. And uh, I think two of them are actually raising money. If you're interested, talk to me. And, and there's one um, company in our US dollar portfolio, uh, which uh, make the, uh, it's called a Cephatonics. The technology was uh, from MIT. And uh, uh, the company uh, has over uh, two dozen um, patents worldwide and they make the uh, fiber optic chips for the uh, current application is for the uh, next generation high definition TVs. So the company uh, come up with a, a new material which can reduce the cost by 90% compared to the mainstream uh, competing technologies. So. Uh, the company um, outsourced all its manufacturing in Taiwan and uh, currently have its customers in Ch China and in Korea. Um, okay, so I'd like to mention uh, two startups. Uh, one um, is, uh, in, uh, well, is invested by Archimedes Labs. It's called uh, Incidental uh, Technologies, um, GTA. Uh, so I haven't seen it in Hong Kong, but the founders, Eden uh, Back, he always swing by Hong Kong to Shenzhen. That's the manufacturing um, uh, site. Uh, so if he comes to Hong Kong, uh, he couldn't come this time. Um, you know, I want you guys to welcome him. <laughs> uh, so uh, he view a, a consumer product um, is a LED uh, iPhone power device power uh, guitar. Um, and uh, Uno Back um, is a wearable health startup that I advise. Um, and uh, the uh, startup also is, uh, go to uh, China, Shenzhen, passing Hong Kong many times. I couldn't get the CTO to come today, but if he swing by next time, I will make sure that you know um, he talk to you. Um, they actually have done a lot of press. Um, they were featured on. Opera magazine uh, in September, the biggest issue. Uh, they are on, uh, you know, Fox News, uh, all the uh, Fox uh, and CNN, you know, all the uh, major outlets. Um, so uh, the next question is, um, what is your investment size, C Angel Series A or late stage? Do you lead or follow? Um, we do all of them. So we lead, we follow, we go from 500K to 100 million in investments. Yeah, we do anything below half a million, and then we usually lead uh, because we like to work closely with the company and go all together all the way, you know, to their uh, success. And, um, and then we also work with other partners. Uh, recently, uh, a project I work with uh, in Silicon Valley was with the Google Ventures uh, and Jason Horowitz. That's really excited. So we also like to work with you know the partner where uh, Chirpy can give help, uh, especially from U.S. going to Asia or you know Asia going back to U.S. Yeah. So we do um, invest from seed round all the way to Series B. Um, investment size typically like seed rounds like a hundred k to three hundred k. 
and then follow-on investment like could be up to like um i think the biggest one we have done is like two million um we so, yeah i think um so you're, you're two, yeah got it that's fine so we typically invest in uh series a round and a series b round also uh like 30% of the deals are in pre-IPO round, but that's not uh, typical. So we invest on from 2 million US dollar all the way to 10 million US dollar. And uh, about uh, two thirds of the company we invest, we are the lead investor and normally we will have a, a board representation. Thank you. So our community is like to lead. We invest you know, uh, 25K all the way up to 100K US dollars. Uh, and we like to be the first money in. Um, Okay, so uh, now um, I'm going to ask very quickly so we can actually go into the discussion. Uh, so uh, have you invested in any Hong Kong startup, including startup founded in Hong Kong, startup based in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong founder? Our committees, so far, none. But I'm Native Hong Kong is one of the partners. Not yet, but I'm looking to change that. Well, I do, <laughs> and the founders are here. Um, so maybe I can introduce them a little bit. So uh, Charlotte, uh, he, she's a co-founder of uh, Spotly. Uh, you guys probably read it uh, on the article where um, uh, they are uh, just launching their uh, products. Uh, it's a, a Pinterest for travel. So you know, a lot of time when you go to travel, you, you gotta ask your friends, yeah, like, hey, where's the top restaurant to go? You know, where's the top place to visit? And a lot of People, you know, like me, I travel, um, you know, 80 to 40 passes a year. So I actually been to a lot of places and I have my, you know, hot list. And I can actually create my list and then everyone, when they go to the country, they can easily, you know, with a, with a press and then you easily see like where to go, where to eat. And so that's the co-founder. And then I also have another uh, mobile game uh, developer, Platency somewhere. <laughs> um, so I'm really honored to, to um, to um, you know, uh, work with uh, you know Hong Kong team, and then uh, I actually work with many teams. Um, you know, like the team in Asia I've worked with, I think the Hong Kong entrepreneur is most international. Um, their thinking and their mentality is really global play, and um, I think that's really one of the most valuable assets to uh, Hong Kong entrepreneur and startup community. And you should really leverage your um, you know. Uh, Com competitiveness and then you know really tackle into a lot of international markets. No wonder you're so busy having all these meetings. Did you close down the street? Uh, yeah, um, I ab absolutely agree. I think Hong Kong is uh, one of the most diverse um, um, set of like uh, talents here, and uh, we invest in a company in Cyberport. It's called Coach Base. I don't know if Keith is here. Uh, or is busy working on the product. Uh, then I will also invest in a Hong Kong um, startup that also moved to Shanghai. It's called Mingbo. They do like um, uh, this like interaction with uh, ultrasound. Then also invest in two companies also like have founders from Hong Kong as well in the US. Okay, currently uh, our, our portfolio do not yet have a uh, Hong Kong based uh, companies, um, but we do have a uh, company who have uh, Hong Kong based uh, CFOs. And uh, we are actually looking at uh, uh, early stage venture uh, is from Hong Kong and we are very interested. Thank you. Um, so uh, even though Archimedes uh, does not have, have not, you know, invest in uh, Hong Kong based or found, you know, startup, but half of our uh, uh, founder that we invest are foreign-born um, uh, founders. Uh, so the next question is, what do you don't invest in? It's a long list. Um, but, you know, broadly, uh, any vice industry, so uh, gambling, um, tobacco, extractive mining, uh, oil exploration, and, you know, Dirty and extractive stuff. Well, you know, um, the, the slogan I always share with, I mean, my personal vision I share with entrepreneurs is if your dreams don't scare you, um, that's not big enough. So um, I don't invest into mixed sense ideas. Um, 
a lot of businesses actually make sense. But if you really like, because I focus on early stage, C stage, and you are here basically to change your world. So you don't, I don't want to get into a business that makes sense. I want the business that thinking out of the box. Doesn't matter; it's going to make money or not. But you have to change your world. Uh, so that's what I do invest, and then what I don't invest. So one of my friend told me the worst thing you can you tell your friend to invest in one of the category is restaurants. So I take the advice: do not invest in restaurants. And also, just because myself, I'm really passionate into wine. I've done like wine for a couple of years, and I will tell people here: do not invest in wineries. <laughs> so for us, what we invest in is like because like from a tech background, like from Silicon Valley, and、uh, I really love like.、Um, SaaS. I love like the cloud platform that enabling all the different possibilities. So these are things we'll invest in. But doesn't mean that we. I don't know what I don't know. So、uh, I cannot say what I'm not going to invest in other than restaurant and winery. And we love restaurants. So if anyone, <laughs> which is true, we invested in a、uh, uh, restaurant chains, which has a、uh, three brands. One is a Thai Thai food brand. Uh, the second one is a Sichuan food brand. The third one is a、um, bakery cafe brand. And、uh, actually, in Hong Kong, I think you have this advantage to look at this restaurant space because if you go to mainland, you can find that the standard is still have a long way to go compared to what you have in Hong Kong. And the reason there's a, a very high successfully IPO of Cui Hua, you must know it. It's a it's a 茶餐厅 from Hong Kong. And they get a very high、uh, response when they did the IPO in Hong Kong. So don't、uh, don't write off the restaurant. And I encourage people to take a good look at it. And for our fund, there's two things we don't invest. One one is the real estate、uh, development projects. The second one is anything you know ethically which is not considered decent. Yeah, thank you. So our committees doesn't invest in startup based outside U.S.,、uh, but we invest in foreign born founders.、Uh, we don't invest in any startup we don't understand. We can't add value. We don't invest in startup that outsource the entire product. Okay, so we say no more than yes.、Uh, so we turn down many startup actually get funded by you know、um, you know our friends like、uh, Fiverr startup. Um, okay, so uh, let's um, go to the main discussion. Okay, so in Web two point、um, era, let me see.、Um, uh, oh, maybe go back to one slide. Okay,、uh, but we have to move very quickly because I have a lot of questions. So.、Um, How do you select startup before you bring them to your partner meetings?、Um, do you require startup to prepare?、Uh, what do you require them to prepare before the partner meetings,、um, or decisive element that can you specify them? Sure, I'll be、uh, attempt to be quick given the amount of ground we're going to try to cover. So、um, I think the key thing is we tend to be data junkies, so we like to measure, 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 and、um, so any. Data on number of visitors, gross margin, repeat users,、uh, what they prefer, language, mobile, percentage, etc. Those are the things that we look for, and they differ from industry to industry.、Um, I'll pass on to you. Yeah,、uh, my thesis will be a little bit different because I focus on C stage, and as you know, C stage are about you know people. So I invest into people, and so like、uh, that's the question was like. What would I suggest、uh, entrepreneur to prepare? I think for a C stage investor like me,、um, uh, we tend to invest people that we trust or we know.、Um, so most of the like the people that are around me,、uh, they don't really go out to look for deals or you know just、um, you know call call to、um, you know visit a company that they think is interesting. They usually、um, you know back to the people that refer from the trust network. So、um, what I would suggest to the、uh, startups or entrepreneur who is considering to do C stage,、um, try to、um, you know meet as many people as possible and make friends before you are looking funding.、Uh, because you know, I mean, 
investors or you know the people that you bump into will not just refer you to the people that they trust or uh, who will invest by just meeting you once or change the business card. And then try not to, um, uh, you know, I, I actually uh, bumped into a lot of people and then they told me, oh, I know who, I know who, uh, who's your friends? And then it's really a negative impact. If I figure out, you know, you guys only mean with one event, then, you know, I'll probably uh, will never, you know, talk to you further. So uh, make friends first and then there's a golden rule. Um, I myself, um, when I look for funding when I started my own company, I actually um, get the money from the people I know for six years. Because um, those people trust me, so they give me money. And then, so always make friends, not just see investors, also VCs. Make, make friends with VC investors when you don't need money. Then, you know, get to understand, let them know you, and then you will increase your hit rate to raise money when you need them. Well, absolutely agree with Matt. Um, I think it's great to have like a good business plan. It's good to have like you know great like user experience. It's good to have like great technology. But at the end of the day, like early stage investment is all about the team. Like, can they execute? Do they have integrity? Like, can they hire? Can they recruit people? And will they be able to gel and co be a cohesive team that go through all the issues and problems? Because like very likely company is going to continue to pivot. So uh, the team, the cohesiveness of the team and the team having the right um, uh, composition is probably the most important part. And that's what we look for when we bring to our investment community. Um, uh, we are actually a, a late stage VC and early stage private equity and more is on the private equity side. So the company normally we invest uh, already have a sizable business and uh, uh, revenue as well as profit. But we uh, don't just uh, reject company who do not have profit yet, but we uh, have to convince ourselves that the company already passed the, the technology risk. So meaning that we will not invest in some innovative new technology, but haven't got any mar market uh, feedback. And the secondly, that uh, uh, we also don't invest in like company who haven't proven it has a, a viable business model. So we need to um, actually visit your customers and, uh, and to hear their feedback and uh, talk to your competitors and uh, your suppliers so uh, we will do a uh, quite thorough, you know, due diligence about one, six weeks to two months, and before we can have our investment committee meeting. Thank you. Uh, so our committees also um, uh, take a lot of risks, uh, just like Matt. Uh, at our early uh, stage seed, um, there's a lot of risks. We take the most risks in the entire uh, pipeline. Uh, so um, we look at founders and uh, and also the founding team. A lot of times, you know, they may not uh, have figured out the product, the business, the model, but we wanted to see if um, the founders, uh, the team are willing to work with us because we are here for the founders. We want to make sure that they are open-minded. They are willing to work with people that have experience, work closely with our partners, and willing to adopt you know, any change. Because uh, it, it changes all the time, and the failure rate of startup at our stage is very, very high. Um, so that's um, kind of lead to um, the next question. So in the Web2, Point O era. Angel invests in startup building around social network like Facebook. The baseline is a hundred thousand user. As we move to mobile first in social mobile location, so molo um, era. Angel invests in startup building around mobile platform like iPhone um, and mobile startup like uh, Tango. Become number one social networking app in 10 days, focusing in nine countries. So why I'm bringing this up, because um, uh, if you're in mobile era startup, they don't have to focus on you know the starting place, like one city or one region. They can actually go worldwide. And that's kind of the number that we've seen. Um, so uh, for years, Hong Kong is competing uh, with um, investment dollars 
um, from uh, Singapore. And Hong Kong is small with 7 million population compared to South Korean or Japan. So Hong Kong started always build the business in Hong Kong first and Hong Kong alone. How does this mindset hurt their funding ch uh, chances? I think it does. I think also the numbers work in Hong Kong's favor in the sense that Hong Kong is a great base to be based out of and you can expand into all these locations because of the two official languages of Hong Kong in English and Chinese, I think you have almost double the amount of great population that you can address. Um, I think one interesting example, I guess, just on the topic of language and location, we're in a company in India that's basically an online version of Gab that sells these uh, fashion uh, online. They have great, uh, very high gross margin, as you would expect, because they're building a brand. Um, they sort of work very well on the Web 2.0 year, like uh, Beth said. So there are 3 million uh, Facebook uh, fans. Um, that's out of 60 million total number of Facebook fans in India. Um, but where they've really taken off recently is they've gotten 25% of their uh, orders from mobile, uh, now that they've built a mobile platform. And what was even more interesting was that they built the mobile platform in all different kinds of local Indian languages. So from Malayalam to um, Audi to Hindi classically, um, it turns out that the, the billion uh, population of mobile subscribers in India and these um, orders coming on the mobile side have all been coming on the English side, um, with the English being associated uh, with a higher end brand. So it turns out English is a, uh, you know, it's a language that works really well in a foreign market that's uh, perhaps not highlighted in sort of the general Asian chart out there. But you know, there's a billion uh, mobile population willing to order from you if you're going to expand your site and uh, your business is over there. Well, yeah, uh, I myself have uh, two uh, typical example um, where I think mobile and the you know current mega trend like wearables, um, mobile messengers is actually a great opportunity for uh, you know you know entrepreneur in Hong Kong to go globally. Um, so one typical example is for, of course IPVO, a company is based in Taipei, but we own thirty two percent market share in the U.S. I have another team in Beijing, a team of eleven. We have eighty million users, mobile users worldwide, 85% is outside China, which we don't have no, we have no clue initially why there's so many users coming out of China, but this really gives you the opportunity to address user outside, you know, globally. Basically, it's very flat. And, uh, but one thing I like to, um, one advice uh, I, I like to give to um, entrepreneurs actually in greater China. Um, so I, uh, I have, a few, about five companies in Taiwan, uh, and then of course uh, the, a few in Hong Kong, and maybe 20 something in China. Uh, a lot of actually um, later stage investor, when they get into the mobile or uh, consumer internet companies, uh, they want them to, um, you know, tell them what their China strategy is. Uh, but by personally, um, do not advise. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the startup team in Hong Kong or something in Taiwan to go to China because, I mean, first of all, the competition is extremely harsh. Secondly, um, you know, the, it's, not, it's not just a language. Language really doesn't mean um, you really know the market. So um, it's a completely different market and you can see so many players, no matter how deep your market is. In US, Japan really have hard time entering China. It's a huge market. Um, if you have a good partner in China, uh, definitely go for it. But if you don't have a local partner, um, you know, there's a huge market in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, what, 80 million Facebook users, um, Philippines, Thailand, you know, the company I just mentioned, 30% are actually in Thailand. And they generated, you know, a bunch of dollars, dollars every month with the 11 team. So um, that's the advice I give you. And then the other advice I want to give you is that because um, most VCs, um, CC, I'm not sure about Angel, but most VC have a regional focus because um, when they raise funds, they need to uh, you know, propose a theme. 
for example, uh, I'm a VC focused on US or focused on Korea, then anything outside that they, they cannot invest. So, but uh, before I think, um, so I started my VC career in 2004. I think 2004 to 2007, there were many VCs in Hong Kong. Uh, they, are talk, they are basically investing in you know, companies between Hong Kong and China. But right now, a lot of people move to China. Uh, there's fewer VC here. Um, so if you want to raise fund, of course, first of all, you need to um, you know, um, expose yourself and penetrate the global market. Secondly, uh, you might want to, you know, also build your brand and then, you know, um, you know, meet some network in maybe Singapore, Southeast Asia, or Japan, Korea, or you know, Bali, where uh, they do cross border. Um, that's the two advice I would like to um, share with the audience. Yeah, I want to address that, like um, as Alan said, Hong Kong is a great place to test the market. Uh, it has the diversity, it has a lot of early adopters, and also a great launching pad to like the rest of Asia. And uh, as Ma uh, Matt mentioned earlier, that this is a very unique place. Like we're having the cyber port, having this kind of infrastructure to support the growing community of like entrepreneurs is very unique. So as an entrepreneur, you wanna think about what's the advantage that Hong Kong can provide you. It may not be the final place that you will stay in Hong Kong and grow your business, but it will be a great place to start a business go through the process, iterate, and also might be a, like a great place to re-export and uh, like from Hong Kong into somewhere else, just like coach base in Cyberport. Started in Cyberport, moved to Oregon with the Nike Plus uh, accelerator program and found its root and its customers really resonating in the U.S. market and then now growing and expanding in the U.S. market. So I would say that um, don't be bounded by Hong Kong being a small market look at the positive side, like the glass is a half full, like what an advantage you can take advantage of here and then use it as a launching pad to the rest of the world. Yeah, I couldn't agree anymore. And I look at the figure on the map, the, the most attractive figure is that it's 1.3 billion and uh, speak the same language. So I would totally agree that you should use uh, Hong Kong as a starting point and uh, uh, look at the greater China uh, and including Taiwan, which has 26 million people and 1.3 billion people in mainland. And these are the huge market for you guys to tap into. But I think the you know, US always have the most cutting edge technology and uh, you should get in touch more often with you know, what's, what's the new trend or what's the new technology in Silicon Valley. And uh, several port I think is a good you know, resource for you to explore. And uh, this morning I toured the stable port and uh, couldn't believe that so many, you know, government sponsored, uh, almost free resource for you guys to explore. So you should, you know, find more what's uh, available in stable port and uh, how you can, you know, leverage the resource here. Thank you. So I brought up this slide because uh, about one or two years ago, I was in Hong Kong and talking to many Hong Kong startups, and uh, many founders actually complained that you know all the money are going to Singapore and uh, very difficult to raise money in Hong Kong. But if you look at the population, uh, we are not smaller than Singapore. We have 7 million, 14 million devices, and then we have 49 million of extra people coming to Hong Kong uh, daily basis. So if you compare, you know, to Japan and South Korea, we can easily, you know, get the user base and growth rate from these population. So it's about your imagination and, you know, determination. So that's why I bring up this slide. Um, so we have to move very quickly uh, to uh, business model revenue. So um, Facebook with 1 billion monthly active user grow the revenue from nothing to 40% with 80% user from mobile. How does this shift help or hurt Hong Kong startup? Alan. I think it will definitely help um, if you look at the number of, I mean, Facebook itself encountered some market valuation issues just based on people worrying that this growth was stalling until they discovered they suddenly had this huge mobile growth. and. On the mobile side, I think the, the excitement and the opportunity set is that uh, you have 
many more people and everyone here has a cell phone, but I think I'm the only one who brought a laptop. So um, everyone's ex sort of using and accessing uh, these services and business models using mobile that uh, I think it opens up a much broader business uh, opportunity set for startups here that can target globally. Well, yeah, um, I totally agree with that, Alan. I think, like I said before, um, uh, mobile is definitely a you know opportunity for entrepreneur to address global market. But again, <laughs> there's something I like to share, and then um, maybe something you can keep in mind. Um, I, I think I mentioned about make sense business model is that when people have business, uh, startup entrepreneur tend to think. Uh, to tend to think a business model that because mobile makes sense. For example, oh, uh, I do check-in, but it's not because you disrupt check-in. It's because the uh, the mobile device involved. So um, so you know because I was so when I whenever I think of a product, or when I you know meet a team or I play with the products, because every day we have you know sleep eight hours and then another eight hours you need to work and then. So every time you turn on your cell phone, it's basically maybe one minute, I mean, five minutes, very fragmented. And I mean, user only have two eyes, so they can only maybe try two or three apps every day. So um, a lot of things that make sense doesn't really, um, you know, broad that must have demand for mobile users. So when you think of a business, um, you, you want to uh, put yourself into that scenario where if I have five minutes, you know, I always like to say, but no offense to education, um, on iPad, um, in the, you know, when you go outside schools and then when you have iPad, when you turn on the iPad, you have five minutes, say on the bus, you will definitely go for entertainment. You will definitely not go for education because, you know, that five minutes you want to have fun. No, I just want, that's just one scenario. Uh, when I look at the mobile education, I'll think of, hmm, so when will the user, what's the user scenario that will use education? At home? Mm, is this pad or you know, is this something for you to, you know, think of, think of, think to? Well, I almost forgot what the original question <laughs> after all this. So um, I think with mobile, it's still a nascent like business model. There are still a lot of opportunity. It's great for Hong Kong for several reasons. One, Hong Kong is probably one of the most advanced like mobile system here. Like people have like all sorts of like uh, new early adopters. And imagine the day that you don't have, you don't need your badaton, and you're going to use that with your mobile phones, like NFC and all this opportunity with a community here that's so advanced in mobile technology, that's only gonna be like new opening comes up and you'll be able to test it in this market and potentially even like export this new technology over to like other parts of the world. So I am definitely like very positive in this like uh, mobile platform, opening up all the different opportunity beyond just Facebook, beyond just mobile, even like internet of things and uh, wearable, all this, what are the cross section? What are the new business model that could come along? I also don't know what the original question is, so but I'm gonna say something anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to because we have a lot so, of questions. So for for the um, I, I guess the question is that uh, what is the opportunity and the threat in in the in the mobile era? And I think that uh, when you do uh, startup ideas uh, with mobile device. You need to try to uh, think about whether um, it can be threatened by the ex existing um, uh, giants or, or already in the market, uh, like the famous Tencent in China. So anything you do, you need to avoid that. Uh, if Tencent finds you, what you are doing is valuable, and that they are going to use their user base just crush you in like two weeks. So this is something you need to bear in mind. Uh, this. Uh, I brought this slide up because uh, Hong Kong startup actually complain about having problem raising funds. So um, if you actually go for mobile, you can find way. Even you know, like Google and Facebook has problem monetizing you know through mobile. Now you know it proven that you know it can be done and it can grow very quickly. And you know, the, uh, there's a culture in Hong Kong that you know consumer uh, here they understand they have to pay for everything. You know, nothing is free. You pay for service and goods. In US, the consumer actually say everything is free. So Hong Kong has a very good chance to actually 
few revenue because of the culture here more open to paying and uh, uh, so uh, and most of the uh, VC and investor are shifting to investing startup building uh, revenue and business model. So you actually have a very good chance in Hong Kong. Uh, now, due to the time, so I have to move very quickly. I would like to mention about uh, Twitter IPO filing this week, um, but I don't have time to go over this. Um, but I want to mention that with all the um, social network um, um, out there, only Twitter is the one that hasn't filed IPO, but it happened this week. Um, uh, you have Apple and Google also, you know, is a mobile platform. Um, messaging app, you can see that, you know, the numbers are approaching to social network size, global. Um, now, since I don't have time, you know, to go over, you know, the Twitter IPO, but I'm going to move into the second big news, which is, you know, AngelList actually introduced um, uh, Synergate. Uh, it basically allow um, uh, Angel investor to allow other followers to uh, fund, follow the fund, and they will give a um, uh, you know percentage, and whatever they invest, they will follow. Uh, so there's a big discussion debate out here, and um, so um, for example, you know. Um, uh, Jason uh, Calacanis uh, claim if three super angels like David Morvan, you know, Pat founder, and uh, Kevin Rose, which is Google Ventures partner, if they combine force together, they can replace VC Series A. Super angel can replace bottom rank VC. So in Silicon Valley, startup founder raise funds from alumni network like Berkeley, Stanford, or corporate alumni like eBay, PayPal, Google, Facebook, incubator alumni like YC, Techstar, and founder raise funds from angel celebrities on AngelList. And most Hong Kong founders didn't really come from this high profile network. They don't know this, you know, super um, angel in person. So how could Hong Kong investor help? You know, just let's hear from the expert. So it's a, you know, it's a new things going on. Sure, I think the very first thing is to sign up for AngelList. I think all of you should do it today if you're not on it. How many people are on an AngelList today? Yeah, I think the rest of you need to do it. Um, so I, the, the value of the network is the number of nodes and the number of the connections between the nodes, which is exponential. So, you know, I think to Bess's point, it's the key thing is you got to get on the network and start to work with some of these people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think everyone should sign up. Um, and I myself actually also have many friends who's, you know, investing through AngelList and then I also have a few portfolio that's, you know, working with AngelList. And, but again, I have a, a other, other stuff to share with you. I think, um, you know, I wish, you know, um, I can have, you know, a platform like AngelList when I started up. But, you know, my lesson uh, to raise fund was, because, um, you know, grow a company actually have a lot of uncertainties. And you do have people that, who can, you know, stand by you and then, you know, give you advice, help you, and then grow the company. And then you also need a lot of resources, uh, you know, when you grow the company. And I think crowdsource is really a good, um, you know, platform for you to, um, you know, find money. I think finding money is, uh, the, the cost is much cheaper. But uh, I would actually agree with uh, the Matt, <laughs> another Matt, it's a point of view where, um, uh, I would suggest you to find a lead investor who actually can help you and will be more hands-on. And then, you know, try to leverage AngelList to fill up the, the rest. And then you will have a good dynamic of investors, uh, you know, who can, you know, help you all together. Uh, I actually do have a few friends who maybe collect 20, 20 um, uh, money from 20 investors. And you know, I you know, I actually had a coffee with him. I said, because I run a company, so I know like the process to interact with the you know investor. You have to prepare reports. You have to you know, um, you know, actually preparing reports is a good exercise for you to know more about yourself. But he said, oh, 
most people I never met, and then uh, there are a few only come to my office once. Um, so you know that's it's really a decision decision call. See what kind of investor you want, but you know as an early stage, uh, you want a lot of people who can help together. But also there's a you know one or two that's more hands on and stand by you. You know help you to grow. Um, that's my advice. So I'm going to answer about like what Hong Kong investors can do to help uh, this, eco um, this ecosystem. The so first thing I want to is, is actually an action I want to call for all the audience here. We need more people to join this like uh, entrepreneur community. So imagine that all four or 500 people here, all of you spend one hour, one month to mentor one of the startup company here will have like four or five hundred man hour per month. That is one thing we need. And if you have spare money instead of like gambling on like you know uh, horse raising, why not spend some money to help uh, one of your friends or your or, or some of your friends' friends like start up like be an angel investor. It doesn't take that much. You know, do, do, join the bandwagon, that's no, number one. Number two is I call for other fellow angel investors to work together. So we can co-invest together, we share deal flows and we will, and I'm the first one who's gonna sign up and say, I will share deal flow with every angel investors. I will share with you what I know. And transparency is a good thing for the community. And the third thing I want to ask for is like, for angel investors or other uh, like VC investors, how do we help the entrepreneurs be successful? And this is the core of why we do investment in the beginning. It's about like helping to build great business. And for us, like we know we have like uh, research resources from the hedge fund side. I use some of the resources to help our portfolio companies do research. And we have now one of my partner runs a design firm. So we snatch three of the top designers to help our portfolio company to do um, design work. So what I'm saying is like, instead of just like providing capital, what other value, what other things we can do to help entrepreneurs be successful? And if, if we all do just one hour per month, everybody do something for this community and we'll have a much stronger and growing community. Thank you. So lots, lots of pressure on me. <laughs> uh, actually, in mainland, uh, there's a similar effect like uh, what uh, Beth described the super angel, um, but not all super angel are the same. And uh, you have to uh, match the, you know, what you are doing with the uh, characteristics and the capability of these angels. And then you, I think you need to uh, try very hard to do networking, 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 and to find how to get in touch with these angels. And uh, I think if you can get funding from the angels who are specialized in the area you try to uh, do your business, you can get lots of help. Not only the fund they give you, but also the resource and network and they can and uh, we as uh, uh, private equity, early, early stage private equity investors, we also found that time to time to get, uh, you know, referrals from these angels. And uh, we tend to find that uh, the deals they invested um, have a uh, higher successful rate than the average deal we find. So you, you know, you have to do your homework to get to know these people. Thank you. Okay, so I have to move very quickly and probably have to cut a lot of pieces. Uh, so, um, VC recruited successful founders as partner. VC high startup found, uh, founding engineers. Now VC moved down the chain. VC recruit product manager, even evangelist at VC partners. All these, you know, like M uh, uh, PM and engineer uh, people that I work with, you know, uh, so they are very technical. So. Um, what should Hong Kong startup do if you have a VC coming from a very technical background? 
oh, we, we really don't have much time, but can we just go through quickly? Any comments? If no, we can pass. And, and maybe I have to come back again because I, oh, like, um, you know, with all the VC going technical, so not VC coming from MBA anymore. They are engineer, like work more than 10, 20 years of experience. So um, all these, you know, VC are judging startup, but Hong Kong startup never really focus on the technical roots. So what do you recommend? Yeah, I, th I actually think some of the Hong Kong startups I've met, uh, the MIST comes to mind, Invest Lab comes to mind. I think they seem to have fairly good technical background. Um, I guess the, the key thing is, well, I guess one, I'm not seeing a huge divide there. Um, but two, to the extent if there is a divide, I think it's helpful for, it's, it's always, I mean, we like uh, sort of technology heavy companies, as you can tell from the, you know, electronic vehicle and uh, rockets, you definitely could need good engineers for that. So I, we tend to, I, I, you know, my personal opinion is you should focus on technology and have a good uh, competitive advantage and, you know, the gap might be might appear to be smaller than you think. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, there's definitely more and more, you know, part of background or engineering background VCs emerging in the market, and which I think is good um, to the community because we'll actually, um, then you actually get more, um, so when you talk to the VC, you actually, you know, talk really, you can talk really deep into the infrastructure and as well as the, uh, you know, the business model itself. So. Um, and, you know, having conversation with the VC actually can boost, you know, your ideas and, you know, um, business model. So um, I think, you know, from Hong Kong, I actually also, um, uh, you know, met with uh, several startups, which is like very solid in te technology. But um, I think, you know, not technology is, is not everything um, for the mobile and uh, consumer internet right now. So, um, so it's a basically, it, you know, uh, how to create a product that people will love to use uh, with no, no doubt. So, uh, so that's that's something that I think. Um, from my experience, I haven't met uh, a founder like an entrepreneur in Hong Kong that's not technical enough. Uh, I'm a technical, pretty technical guy. I, I don't think I've met anyone has not technical enough. But the challenge usually is like how, when they grow to a certain size, can they recruit enough technical people? And I've seen that um, for uh, start in Hong Kong, they actually set up like office in Shenzhen, which is pretty close by, or even in Wuhan, uh, where technical resources are a lot less expensive. So I think um, I don't see personally see like a. a is inferior, the technical capability is inferior. At least I haven't seen it myself. Well, I think uh, if you don't have technical background, then it's already too late. There's no way you can get it. But, <laughs> I mean, which is true, right? But not all startup, you need to do a tech technical startup. And in Hong Kong, think about the China, 1.3 billion people, the market there. And there are lots of things which you can do in China, and uh, you can do startups in other service-related, consumer-related industries, and uh, you know you can be a successful entrepreneur without any technical background. So that's my view. Thank you. Uh, down to our lowest chain, you know, uh, I actually encouraging non-technical founders start learning coding and start getting more involved with the product. So that's, you know, how I get them to get deeper, you know, in the technology chain to, in order to compete, you know, a uh, uh, startup from Silicon Valley. So I have tons of questions. I have prepared a lot of things. I don't have time. Maybe I have to come back sometime, you know, to continue the discussion. But all these discussion are all designed and tailored to help Hong Kong startup like you. you looking for funding. So, um, so uh, let's go to Q&A. If there's no one to ask question, we're going to move on. OK, Mike, uh, I, I saw him first. Can, can you do it quick? Hi, guys. Um, uh, my name is Ming. Uh, I'm the co-founder of NAUS, um, which is a cloud sourcing hedge fund that aims to um, 
manage a hundred billion dollar in the future. So um, since we're doing cloud sourcing, we get signal from everywhere in the world. So and at one point we actually want to um, enter the China market because um, it's, there's a lot of cloud there. Um, so one of the I remember one of the guest speaker mentioned that China market is um, hard. To, it's different from everywhere else. It's hard to um, enter. So I just want to know what exactly is um, the difference and the challenge. Thanks. Oh well, yeah. Um, so I think uh, the 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 space that I think um, is hard for uh, outside, you know, to go to China is definitely in the TMT. You know, the mobile med uh, media. And the reason why is because there's actually a lot of um, because um, there's more and more different business model emerging in China. So uh, there's a lot of you know different you know new policies pumping over the market, and also um, you know. Um, in terms of the uh, the infrastructure wise, uh, or you know the uh, the restricted uh, you know business area, that's a lot of things that change very fast and very quickly. So um, it's better to, like I said, uh, it's a huge market, and then if you have a good local partner you can work with, um, then you know that's definitely the market you want to address. But um, purely just if you know the team is in Hong Kong, and then uh, you definitely need, need to uh, you know think more, think twice. Uh, but I think because China also become more and more open in terms of their market intelligence, so um, you can actually uh, leverage on uh, you know social media, or you know the you know there's also a lot of you know networking you know um, events where you can attend and then get to know people and then um, and find people who has the similar experience. Um, um, so that's probably something that I would uh, advise. Uh, okay, so um, we don't have too many people, you know, really fighting for questions, so I have to close the Q&A. Uh, but what I do want to hear from you is, is this useful? Because it's tons of work for me and, you know, our guests. Do you want us to come back? Is it useful to you? Clap. I want to see how much you want it. Is it little or a lot, you know? Like, what is the excitement from you? Okay. What do you think? You will come back? Yeah? Okay. All right. So um, I would like to thank the panelists. I also would like to make one announcement. Um, so uh, I have um, a uh, conference in, uh, on November 2nd, uh, and the keynote is El Gore, Steve Walsiet, uh, Apple co-founder, and a um, Mark Zuckerberg sister, actually, Randy. Uh, be the closing keynote. Uh, so uh, this is our opportunity for you. If you, uh, Hong Kong startup, decided to um, uh, expand to US, talk to me because I'm part of the conference committee and I can actually get you, you know, like a uh, uh, sp table space and get in, even though we are closing deadlines. So that's about it. But thank you, all the uh, panelists here. Thank you. Give them a big welcome. So I'd like to pass the mic to uh, Matt. He's leading the second panel.